Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the Sanger method of DNA sequencing. Now this is normally taught at A level and IB. In the unit, um, looking at the topics on locating and sequencing genes, usually you, you study DNA probes and DNA hybridization, how they're used to locate specific genes, and you look at restriction mapping and how that can help to determine the sequence of nucleotides in a gene. But what we're going to look at today is a process invented by the man you can see on the top right, Sanger. And what he, his process enables us to do is look at the exact order of nucleotides on a strand of DNA. So that's what we're going to look at in this video. Now it involves reading the base sequence of a length of DNA. And as I said, it's based on the technique developed by Mr. Fred Sanger in Cambridge in 1975, so fairly recently. Um, and it's now referred to as Sanger sequencing. There is um, something known as cycle sequencing, which is a kind of modified version of the Sang method, which I'll look at at the end of this video. So let's look at the process of Sanger sequencing, or sometimes actually called chain termination sequencing. So the first thing to do is we're going to have four test tubes. One three, four. So this is step step one. We have four test tubes and we're going to label them A, T, C and G. Now that clearly represents the, um, the four bases in DNA that we have, adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine. And just for a visual we'll just I'll just add a little bit of colour just to make it a bit different. So we'll say A is blue. We'll go red for T. Green for C. And we'll go pink for G. Just to, to keep this a bit more simplified, and a bit more visual. So you've got four test tubes labelled A, T, C and G. Now what we're going to add to each of those tubes are four different things. So into those four tubes, into each one of those tubes, what we're going to do is put a sample of the DNA to be sequenced So into each of those tubes we'll have a sample of DNA that we actually want to sequence. Now that would contain many millions of individual molecules. We're then going to put in a radioactive primer. And this is so that the DNA can be visualised later on. Now radioactive, or something the same as radio labelled. And when we think about a primer, what we mean is a strand of nucleic acid that really serves as a starting point for DNA synthesis. But I'll come back to that in a, in a little bit later. So we've got the sample of DNA to be sequenced, the radioactive primer, and now what we need to include in this mixture, if you like, are the four DNA nucleotides. So the four... DNA nucleotides. So we need um, lots of the A's, the T's, the C's and the G's as such. And then finally what we're going to put into this test tube is the enzyme DNA polymerase. Now polymerase is the enzyme that allows DNA bases to join on to one another. So we have these four ingredients as such and we're putting them all into these four labelled test tubes that we've got, the ones with A, T, C and G. So that's the first step. There we need to include those four things in. Because we've got a DNA sample, if we think this through, we've got a DNA sample, we've got a radio, radio labelled or radioactive primer that's going to join on to a specific portion of that DNA sample. 
We have free nucleotides, hence why we've put the four nucleotides in there, the A, T, Cs and Gs, and polymerase to bind them. So ultimately what we're going to get are those four, or those free nucleotides binding onto this DNA sample, this strand or this template strand that we're using in this process. Now in step two, what we have to do is add something a little extra to these test tubes. So let's think about what step two is. In each test tube, we now need to add a small amount of a special modified dideoxynucleotide, as it's called. And this cannot form a phosphodiester bond. And what that means is that it stops further synthesis of DNA. And these are also radioactively labelled. So just to repeat, so we're adding what's called the dideoxide or dideoxonucleotide to each test tube. And because they can't form phosphodiester bonds, ultimately they just stop synthesis of DNA. So they, if you think about it, they terminate um, this um, chain sequence. They will stop any more bases being added. They will terminate the sequence there and then. And we have a dideoxy-A, a dideoxy-T, a dideoxy-C, dideoxy and a dideoxy-G. And for the purpose of this, what we're going to do is call them A, T, C, and G with a star. So for step two, what we're going to do is add dideoxy nucleotides and we're going to add as I said the A star the T with the star and remember these are the ones that are radio labelled also the C with the star and then we've got G with the star so these are special modified versions now we're going to put the A star, the dideoxy A, into tube A. The T star into tube labelled T, the C star into the tube labelled C, and the G star into the tube labelled G. So that kind of makes sense. If we draw a dashed arrow up, that one would go in there. This one with the C star would go into there. You can see where this is going, that one into there. And then just for completeness sake, we'll add that one into there. So we're going to add these dideoxynucleotides. Now the dideoxynucleotides are present at about 1% of the concentration of the normal nucleotides. So it's only a very small amount we're adding. And that's really important to remember. It's only a very small amount that we're adding for the adding to these tubes and just to say again that these are radio labeled or radio active. Now let's look at step three. What we do is allow the DNA polymerase to synthesize many copies of the DNA sample. Now from time to time at random a dideoxynucleotide will be added to the growing chain and synthesis of that chain will then stop. So what we get is a range of DNA molecules being synthesized from full length to very short. Now the important point is that in tube A, all the fragments would stop at an A nucleotide. In tube T, all the fragments stop at a T nucleotide and so on. So in tube A, if we look at the tube in blue, because we've put the A star nucleotide, basically we'd have our sample of DNA in tube A and we'll make multiple chains. Lots of the polymerase would help add lots of bases onto those, onto those chains. But on certain chains, that A star nucleotide would be added and that would then stop the sequence. So what we get is something that looks a little bit like this. If I shrink the screen a little bit here, I will move this up just so that I can show you what the end result is. It would look a little something like this. If I just shrink this down a bit and put this in position. So I'm just going to explain what 
what we've got here. We can make this a tiny bit bigger if I can space this out a little bit more. There. Now, what we've had are DNA fragments being synthesised in each of the tubes. And you look for the smallest fragment. Now the smallest fragment we can see here is the one, if I just circle it, the T with the star on. So that means that when the T star dideoxynucleotide was added, it was able to cut the chain, it, was to ter it would terminate that DNA synthesis at that point there. So we have one base added. Now that is usually our starting point. Then we can see if we look to the left, when T A star, so if we say that's number one, that's number two, when we get T A star, we can see that's two bases long, and then that chain has been cut off. So it would make sense that we begin our sequence with T, and then the next letter in the sequence would be A, because the A star was the second one there that would cut it off. So it's quite an odd method, but you simply just look up and go up in numbers from smallest to largest. So after TA, we can notice that here we've got TA, T star, which is three bases long. So that would imply that we've been able to have T join first, A join second, and then when the next T joins, that's able to cut the chain off. That's the third. So you might be able to predict that the fourth one along would be this one over to the right here, TAT G star, because when the G star is added, we then get a termination of the sequence. Key thing again to say is that in tube A, all the fragments will stop at an A nucleotide. In tube T, all the fragments stop at a T nucleotide. In tube C, all of the um, fragments stop at a C. And in tube label G, all of the fragments will stop at the G nucleotide. So if we continue this, if we, if we look at the smallest and then work our way up, you can start to predict what the original sample of DNA, what the order of those nucleotides in that original sample rather are. So we've got a T, then A, then a T, then a G. So we could continue like that or we continue the process into step three. Now step three involves gel electrophoresis. Now in a separate video I've, I've talked about um, southern blotting and gel electrophoresis and the principles behind it in that we have a a positive end or a positive terminal and negative terminal and that DNA because it's negatively charged moves towards the positive terminal smaller fragments moving more so I'm not going to go into too much detail there I'm just going to really very quickly sketch outline just the basic principle here so we're going to imagine A, T, C and G. What we're going to do is take the contents of the four tubes and run them side by side on electrophoresis gel. And we can actually then see and visualise the DNA bands by what's called autoradiography. Since the fragments are now sorted by length, the sequence can simply read or be read off the gel, starting with the smallest fragment at the bottom and reading upwards. Remember, the smallest fragment would be the one with just one nucleotide. So if we were to do electrophoresis on this particular sample, what we'd see is something that looks like this. I'll just draw it and then I'll explain what it means. So you might be able to get a banding pattern like that. And if we're saying that the DNA fragments have moved in this sort of direction with the longer fragments at the top, so we've put L for longer fragments staying near the, the top here, and the shorter fragments, this one one's moving more to the bottom. If we were to read this from the bottom up, we can see, if we look at the letters, we've got a T, 
A, T, G, and this matches exactly what we were reading here when we we're just looking at the letters. So we can see if we were to complete the sequence, we'd get T, A, T, G, A, C, C, G. And we can show that by, if we take the T, A, T, G, the next one in the sequence according to this electrophoresis pattern is A. So if we go back to our letters, we can see, and I'll do this in, I'll highlight this one in, in um, a different colour. After T, A, T, G, we can see the next sequence here is actually this one, T, A, T, G, A star. So that one would be a fifth, so it matches. And that is simply how you can read this. So these are the three simple steps to the Sanger method of DNA sequencing. We take four tubes, label them A, T, C and G, and in those four tubes we have our samples of DNA to be sequenced. And we have four DNA, our four DNA nucleotides, or a sample of those four nucleotides with enzyme DNA polymerase. And what we're going to ultimately get is those, or are those nucleotides binding to those um, samples of DNA that we're looking to sequence. And we're going to include a radioactive primer in there for visualisation purposes. We then add dideoxynucleotides that are radiolabeled. And in this video I've referred to them as A star, T star, C star and G star. And when those add or get added onto the DNA strand, DNA synthesis halts or shuts down. We terminate that chain sequence. And then through a process of gel electrophoresis, we're able to read that DNA sequence by running the contents of the four tubes side by side and look at those individual fragments that we've got. Now, just to finish off in this video, I want to mention something called cycle sequencing. Because this is actually a new modified version of the Sanger method and it's completely automated. The primers this time are not radio labelled but instead the four dideoxynucleotides are fluorescently labelled. Each one with a different colour. Now in real life the A star is green, T star is red, C star is blue and G star is yellow. Now a bit of extra detail here. The polymerized reaction, or the polymerization reaction rather, is done in a single tube using PCR-like cycles to speed up the process. And the resulting mixture is separated using what's called capillary electrophoresis, which gives good separation in a single narrow tube gel. Now that gel is read, read by a laser beam and the sequence of colors that you get is converted to a DNA sequence by a computer program. And this technique can sequence at about 12,000 bases a minute, which is extremely high. So if we look at the very top left, just to finish off the top left of this video, what I have been explaining in this video is ultimately how to get, or how to work out the sequence of DNA from something like that. That picture on the, or from that picture, the left part, you can see the, the black banding pattern. But what I'm talking about here is this bit on the right. You can see that those letters A, T, C and G, each one has a different colour and you get a particular um, waveform of each of those colours and using a computer we can work out what the DNA sequence is. So it's a new modified version of the Sanger method that is completely automated. Okay, hope all that helps.